Well, if you all could open up your Bibles to Psalm 12, it is a great joy to be able to come and share the word with you all uh, this morning. Now, all these fun little things up here. Um, I am reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. That's just a translation of choice. But if you are using the Pew Bible, according to the bulletin, it's on page 422. 422. So Psalm 12. And let us hear God's precious word together. For the choir director, according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David. Save, O Yahweh. For the holy man ceases to be. For the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak worthlessness to one another. With a flattering lip and with a double heart they speak. May Yahweh cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are, are our own. Who is Lord over us? Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says Yahweh. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. The words of Yahweh are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the ground, refined seven times. You, O Yahweh, will keep them. You will guard him from this generation forever. The wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you, as we come to hear your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to be attentive, that your Holy Spirit would convict us where we need conviction, and that your Holy Spirit would give strength to your servant that I might preach your word with clarity and with soundness. And we commit this time unto you for the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, if you are a note taker, the title of my sermon is The Purity of Yahweh's Words. And I have three points. What's a sermon without three points, right? Worried words, wicked words, wonderful words. So worried words, wicked words, and wonderful words. Now, you can't see it any longer, but when I was a child, I had a birthmark on my face. It was probably, mm, about, took out about that much of my face, and it was right there on my, I think that's the right cheek, on my cheek, and everyone could see it, my peers could see it, and I can remember as a, uh, a child in, in, in elementary school, uh, being made fun of many a times. Oh, look it, you have dirt on your face. Oh, you should go wash your face. And the word of advice that was given to me, maybe from my parents, maybe from those in authority, I can't quite remember, but they used to say to me, say this to those kids who say this to you, say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Well, whether or not that saying is true and accurate, we are going to look at the words of the wicked, the words of of the psalmist. We're going to look at the words of Yahweh and see the impact of those words and how they can bring consolation and how they can bring grief. So first point, the worried words of the psalmist. Notice how the psalm starts out, Save, O Yahweh, for the holy man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. Notice who David expresses his concern to. He expresses his concern to Yahweh, or the Lord, and Yahweh is the covenant name of God. So he is expressing his concern to the one in whom he is in covenant with. And he says to Yahweh, he says, save, or some translations say, help. Now interesting enough, these two words, save and Yahweh, if you put them together, you get the name Joshua, which means the Lord is salvation. So it comes from Yahweh and Yasha. We get Joshua. The Lord is salvation. Now, 
That is a Hebrew word. Does anyone know what the Greek word is for Joshua? Yes. Well, Jesus, yeah, Jesus. Jesus' name means the Lord is salvation. Why? I think it's Luke, because he will save his people from his sins, right? That's what the angel declared. So Joshua means the Lord is salvation. So David is calling upon, calling out to Yahweh, because the Lord is salvation. He is the deliverer. And David would know this from experience. Children, do you know the story of David and Goliath? Where he goes and he stands up against this giant, this really tall man, and the Lord being his strength gave him victory over Goliath. Later on in his life, he was running from Saul. And how many times did God protect David from Saul? He even protected David from his own family. We think of Absalom who rebelled against him, who had an insurrection against his own father. But yet, Yahweh, the Lord, delivered him. So he calls out to the Lord because the Lord is one he could trust. But notice his concern. Notice what is absent. Notice what his, his worried words are expressing. He is asking, where are the godly? Where are the godly? The translation says, or the, the, the scripture says, for the holy man ceases to be. Now this word holy man, or could be translated godly, comes from the Hebrew, and, and, and I'm no Hebrew expert as far as pronouncing it is concerned, but hasid. Now not hesed, but hasid. However, you hear hesed in that. Now hesed is the word translated uh, um, uh, steadfast love. But hasid is the word that's being translated here, and it's first used in Psalm 4.3, and it can be understood as the one who's the covenant one. That is, those who are loved by God. Those who are loved by God. So this word has the understanding of being one, of the, one in covenant with God, one who is loved by God. And so you could say, playing, some, uh, playing off words here in the Hebrew, the hesed are hesed by Yahweh. Or to put it another way, the faithful covenant keeper is loved with a covenant love by the covenant God. So that's who we're talking about here when we say the holy man. And what's the problem? They cease to be. This is the issue. Those who love God and keep his covenant, his covenant cease to be. This is the dilemma that the psalmist David is expressing. Now the second half of the verse here in verse 1 is building upon the first half of the verse when he again writes, for the faithful disappear. The faithful. Again, another way of talking about the one, uh, the, about the Holy One. This is one who is faithful to God. It's referring to uh, uh, that these faithful people are those who can be trusted to keep their word. So we have these faithful ones, and what is the issue? Again, they are those who are faithful to God that they have disappeared. So here is David, he's expressing his concern. Where are the godly? Where are the faithful? And he's expressing that. It almost sounds like someone else we know in the Old Covenant, a, a particular prophet by the name of Elijah. And do you remember Elijah and his expression, him expressing something very similar to David here? He says in 1 Kings, uh, Elijah expresses his, 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 his concern. He says, I've been, been very zealous for Yahweh, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, pulled down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. So here, Elijah expressed that he was the only one left, that there are those who are seeking his life. A very similar sentiment of David that we find here in the psalm. And then notice, so we have what is absent, but notice who or what is present. So what is absent is the godly ones, the holy man, 
but who or what is present. I'm going to jump down to verse 8 for a moment here. It says, The wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. So what is present? Well, David is expressing how the reality for him of the presence of the wicked. And, and it's interesting, the language here is he says that they strut about on every side. And, and what I think about is a peacock. How many of you have seen a peacock before? Okay. Well, the amusement park that my wife and I met at had peacocks uh, at the amusement park. And that male, when he, he would flash those beautiful feathers and he would just strut about like, look at me, look at me, right? And in many ways, that's the image that's going on here with, with the wicked. They are strutting about. I think of the song uh, from Fiddle on the Roof, If I Were a Rich Man. Tevier is singing about his wife, and if he is rich, this is what he would see happening concerning his wife. I see her putting on airs and strutting like a peacock. Oy, what a happy mood she is in. So here, the wicked are strutting about, and they're strutting about on every side. So everywhere you go, you are seeing these wicked strutting about. And this is even expanded upon on the second half of verse 8 when he says, when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. So what is vileness? Vileness is moral impurity. Uh, it could even be understood as being worthlessness. Worthlessness. I.e. not precious. Which later on or earlier on, the description given of Yahweh's words are that which is precious, that which is valuable. But something that is worthlessness is not precious. And so we see even a contrast there. But this vileness, this moral impurity is being exalted. And it's being exalted among the sons of men. This is the view within their society that is going on at this time in David. It was a society where certain sins were being exalted. That which was worthless being exalted. Let's just pause a moment and think. What are some of the sins that are exalted in our society that people go and strut about in? Right off bat came to mind was those of the various sexual sins. We think of fornication. We think of homosexuality being strutted about as if it is okay. But let's recap here. The psalmist is worried that the godly are absent, that the godly are missing, and that the wicked abound and are prevalent. Secondly, the wicked words of the sons of men. The wicked words of the sons of men. Verses, starting in verse 2, they speak worthlessness to one another. With a flattering lip and a double heart, they speak. So notice first about the wicked words of men, about their speech. Notice their speech. Notice what they're saying. Notice what is contained in their words. Their words are worthlessness. They're, they're empty. They're insincere. As one put it, words with no corresponding truth behind it. These are the words that they're speaking. They're empty. They're, they're not being sincere. They also have flattering lips. Flattering lips or smooth talk or insincere praise. Now, I think some of us might admit that there are times where if that person comes along and they're flattering us and giving us praise, that, that it's something that, that makes us happy. Uh, it, it, it creates in us a, uh, 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 even to some degree, there's, there's an addiction that it creates because you want to hear that. I want to I hear people speak nice of me. I want I to hear, and, and so this one with the flattering lips he knows that. He knows that, that people would, would like to hear nice things about them. And so he doesn't really mean what he's saying, but he says them anyways. He gives that praise anyways, and it's not sincere. 
Uh, one commentary puts it this way. They say, they say the right things that people want to hear. But that's not what they truly believe. And that's even built upon later on in the next verse. Uh, who? Uh, sorry. Um, oh, and no, still in verse 2. With flattering lips and with a double heart, they speak. So this is enlarging that even more. A double heart. That is, the, another way of talking about it is deception or having two indifferent intentions. And so your, their intention is not right. They give the appearance of one thing, but their intention is that of something else. We may even say in, in the true sense of the word, it's hypocrisy. But who are speaking these words? Who are speaking these words? Well, it's the sons of men. Uh, arguably, it is the society in which David is in. They're speaking, and what's interesting is they speak this way to one another. They're speaking to one, away, uh, to one another in this way. Interesting, interesting life, interesting culture that's going on, interesting what is happening in this society around David. But notice even further the arrogance that these people have. In verse 4, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us? They're here claiming autonomy. Who is Lord over our lips? Who owns our lips? And they're saying, we own it. We're Lord of our own lips. But who? But who is truly Lord of our lips? Is it not God Almighty? Exodus 4.11 And Yahweh said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, Yahweh? It is the Lord God who is Lord over our lips. But these sons of men here, these wicked people, they are claiming autonomy from God and saying, no, our lips do not belong him to him. We are Lord over them. But notice then the damage Verse 5, for beginning of verse 5, because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy. Their words are devastating. Their words cause the needy to cry out, to call out. And their words, these wicked words that they're speaking are, are not just on occasion, but it's per, per, pervasive. Well, what about, what do we see today? How, what is people's speech like today? What, it, it, was it just then, in that culture, in that day, where, where people spoke worthlessness to one another and flattered one another and were double-hearted in their, in their speaking? What sins of the lips, if you may, do we see in our society? Well, one example is the pervasiveness of lying in our culture, especially in pulp culture. The long-running British TV series, Doctor Who, the 11th Doctor, his number one rule was that the Doctor lies. And I'll tell you, when, not, when I ever heard that, I'm a Doctor Who fan, if, if you, you haven't picked up yet, I was devastated, because I was like, what? What? No, that's not good. Because then you start questioning. Anyways, but this is common in our society. Lying is okay. It's permissible. And it's promoted. And it's exalted. And I'll come to our third point, the wonderful words of Yahweh. So we've seen the worry words of the psalmist. We've seen David's concern. We've seen the wicked words of the sons of men. Now we come to the wonderful words of Yahweh. And this is the best part. Yahweh sees the affliction of his people. He sees what's going on. He sees the devastation that is going on. He, sees, he hears the groaning. Again, verse 5, because of the devastation, because of the groaning. And then listen, now I will arise. It's not David who's speaking here, but it is Yahweh. It is the covenant God. He says, now I will arise. It's action. 
He is moving. He is doing. There is action on the part of Yahweh. I will arise. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. This is Yahweh acting. It is David's covenant God that is acting. And he says that I will set him in the safety for which he longs. Safety. How do we understand that? Well, we could put it another way. We could, it, could have, it has the idea of salvation, the idea of deliverance and, and protection. As one person put it, often implying a victory is at hand. So David starts off by saying in verse 1, Save, O Yahweh. And now he is recording what God will say in bringing this deliverance and bringing this safety to his people, to that which they long for. And really, this deliverance would be the consequence of prayer. This one, this needy, this afflicted, they are longing for the safety. They are groaning out. They're calling out to their covenant God. And God is listening. And God is responding. Verse 6, the words of Yahweh are pure words. What do we mean by pure words? Well, it would be good to have a definition here. And, and pure, to eat pure words, we can say, are free from moral defilement, without spot, not sullied or tarnished, incorrupt, undebased by moral or wickedness. Pure words are holy. I think one theological term that might encapsulate that is the word inerrant. Have you heard that word before? Inerrant, that is without error. Another word is infallible. And, and if you can, for a moment, if you can hear R.C. Sproul in, in your mind, uh, 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 he said something along the lines of infallible means unable to error. Um, and this is what God's word is. It's free from moral defilement. It is inerrant. It is without error. It is infallible. It cannot error. And where does this purity come from? Where does the purity of God's word come from? It comes from the very nature of God. These are his words which he is speaking. Well, what's the nature of God? God declares in Leviticus 11.45, for, uh, for I am Yahweh who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God, thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. Our brother read earlier in our Old Testament reading how the angels declared in Isaiah 6.3, and one of the angels called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. So God declares it. The angels declare it. And the saints declare it in Revelation 15, 4. Who will, never, uh, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify Your name? For You alone are holy. Our confession summarizes it well or incorporates this truth in the second chapter, paragraph one, when it says God is most holy, most holy. And so here we have a God. Our God is a holy God, trice holy God. And the words, therefore, that he speaks are going to be holy. They're going to be pure. They cannot be anything but pure because of who God is, because of His holy nature. Now notice then the contrast. So we hear, have here God's pure words. That God's word is true versus the words of the wicked that are worthless. God's word is sincere versus the flattering lips of the wicked. God's word is honest versus the wicked words of the, uh, of the words of the wicked, which are double heart. 
So God's word is true. God's word is sincere. God's word is honest. Now, which words would you rather have? The words of the Lord or the words of the wicked? Which would you rather be immersed around? But notice even further the metaphor that's given. The metaphor that David gives concerning God's pure words. It's, it's compared to silver being tried. As silver tried in a furnace on the ground, refined seven times. When silver is tried in this way, these, these words are speaking to the fact that it has no impurities. When, when silver is tried over and over and over again, it's to get rid of the impurities that are in it. And so this is most pure. And so it's being applied to God's Word, showing and emphasizing the fact that God's Word has no impurities. We can trust it. We can rely upon it. And it will not disappoint. But not only does it have no impurities, it also has value. Gold that, ha I mean, sorry, silver that has been refined. The purer the silver, the most valuable it is. Now let me ask you, do you see the value in what we have here in our hands? We have the Word of God. This is of utmost value. Do you remember the story, the parable of the man who who finds a treasure in a field. And what does he do? He says all that he has so he can get that field and get a hold of that treasure. Do we recognize the value of the Scriptures? Do we recognize the value of our Bibles? The words that are contained in these pages. Do we recognize its value? That it's pure? I think if we were to do so, it'd be great value to our souls. David not only affirms the purity of God's Word here, but also in Psalm 19. Psalm 19, verse 8, the second half of the verse is this, the commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. Our New Testament reading came from 1 Peter Chapter 2, and in verse 2 it says this, Like newborn babes long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow up in respect to salvation. It is pure milk. It's the best thing for us, and it, can help us to, it helps us to grow in our salvation. So what then are some of the implications of God's Word being pure? Well, one is it's proof that it is the Word of God. That the Bible is the Word of God. Now I know we're Reformed Baptists, but the Westminster Larger Catechism uh, in question four says this, how does it appear that the Scriptures are the Word of God? Right? Good question. How does it appear that the Scriptures are the Word of God? And it starts off like this. Listen to this answer. The Scriptures manifest themselves to be the Word of God by their majesty and purity. So the fact that the Word of God is pure shows, gives evidence that this is the very Word of God, that the Scriptures are truly, as Paul writes in Timothy, are breathed out by God. So then what, as believers, must we do in light of this? In light that this is God's Word, that it is pure, what are things that we ought to do? Well, one, we need to learn God's pure Word. Here we have this treasure. We need to learn from it. We need to glean from it. We need to feast upon it. I confess, last night I had more than one portion of the, uh, the, the beef. It was really good. I had multiple portions. And it, because it was so good. Well, God's word is even better than that, 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 that what we had last night. It's, it's so much. And what it does for us and our soul is, is just amazing. And so we need to learn God's pure word, which means we need to be sitting under the preaching of the word and the teaching of the word. So we need to be faithful to be here on the Lord's Day and 
in the Lord's morning and in the Lord's evening, being under the teaching and the preaching of the Word. We need to meditate on God's pure Word. Now, by meditation, I don't mean sit cross-legged, put your hands like this, and humma, humma, humma. That's not what I mean. Meditation is a good word, if understood correctly. And if I remember correctly from my, my, uh, Hebrew, my Old Testament class, uh, meditate means has the idea of chewing on the cud. So you just you think upon it over and over again. You're thinking upon God's Word. You're thinking about the passage that was preached. You spend time even memorizing it so that you can get it into your head and you can think upon it. So meditate on God's Word. Trust God's pure Word. As a child, as our children... Many a times we teach them, trust what daddy has said to you. Trust what mommy has said to you. Unlike frail human, God, word we can always trust. We can always rely upon because it is pure. Live by God's pure word. How can we keep our ways pure? By the pure word, Psalm 119.9. How can a young man keep his way pure? But according to the word of God. And I'm paraphrasing there. Live by God's word. And then fifthly, share God's pure word. So meditate on God's word, learn God's word, trust God's word, live by God's pure word, and share God's pure word with others. God has placed each one of us in a different place. Some of us, we're at home with our children, schooling them, caring for them, managing the home. Other of us are, have a nine to five job, if you may. Some of us have a, what was it, a, a midnight to 8 a.m. job. Uh, God has placed us in different places. Not every one of you are called to stand on a street corner and proclaim God's pure word. Some of you may are but others are not. But wherever God has placed you, share God's pure with others. So that might be with your children, that might be with your friends, that might be with your coworkers, whatever the context might be, because others need to hear the truth. This is why we need to be supporting missions, right? We need to be supporting that the word goes out to the, pure word goes out to the ends of the earth, as well as throughout this county, throughout the state of Georgia, throughout the Southeast, we can support the sharing of God's word through that means as well, by supporting others. We, uh, in a couple of weeks, you'll be having uh, Pastor Michael coming to share, and he's, if I understand correctly, he is being a missionary in a part of North Carolina. So we need to be sharing God's word. We need to be supporting those who share God's word uh, as part of reflecting upon the implication of God's word being pure. Well, let me make some further points of application. We mentioned how the psalmist starts off, Save, O Yahweh. And that the name Joshua means God is salvation, or the Lord is salvation. And I mentioned briefly that the New Testament, or the Greek equivalent to Joshua, is Jesus. Well, Jesus Christ is the pure word of God. He is true. He is sincere. And he is honest. He is the great I am. He is Joshua. Yahweh is salvation. And he is able and willing to save. So when we're surrounded by the wicked words of those in our society... Let us call out to Christ. Let us hold fast to Christ who is the pure word of God. But him being pure and us as believers, we're being conformed into his likeness. Therefore, we need to examine ourselves. Examine our speech. Freedom of speech is the Western rally cry, isn't it? Well, I have the freedom to say whatever I want. But as Christians, 
What does the Scripture say regarding our speech? It is to be guided and directed by the Word of God. Ephesians 5, 3 and 4. But sexual immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Nor filthiness, nor foolish talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So brothers and sisters, what is your speech like? We are to be image bearers. And part of being conformed to the image of God's Son is that our speech be pure. So let me ask you, are your words pure? Do you lie? Are the words you speak to others insincere? Do you have a double heart when you talk? Do you like to flatter people? Such actions are a violation of God's law. It would be a violation of which commandment? Anyone know? Do we know? The ninth commandment, right? We shall not bear false witness. And when we break God's commandment, that is called sin. One of the things I appreciate about the catechisms and studying the Ten Commandments is you learn that each commandment is really an umbrella to encompass a variety of sins that follow, fall under that. And I think we need to understand, therefore, that, that, that like with all sin, the sin of lying or the breaking of the Ninth Commandment is the consequence is punishment. So let me just use lying, for example, for, exa for a moment, because since it does incorporate, really, if you look at it as an umbrella, it does incorporate all that the psalmist has been expressing his concern about. It encompasses the flattering lips, the double heart, the, the worthlessness that is spoken among one another. And lying is wicked. It's kind of sobering to think, and maybe you've never really paused to think about it, but lying is a quality of the devil. And, and I'm not making this up. Jesus describes Satan as the father of lies. And so when, when Satan acts, he acts according to his own nature. And if, if we're engaged in lying, then, then we're acting like him. And so as Christians, I think that that should cause us to say, wait a second, I don't want to imitate the devil in my speech. I do not want to imitate the devil and in, in, in lie. I want to be like Christ. I want to be an imitator of Him. And so I'm harping on this for a moment, but, but I, I think in light of the culture in which we live, in which lying is treated so carelessly, so casually, so like it's not a big deal if, if you tell your boss something that's not true. Or you lie to him. He asks you a question, you lie to him, I should say. And your intent to deceive. Or I think we take that so lightly. But if you are, if you have, if you... If you do lie if it is part of your, your lifestyle. If you do flatter, if you do double speak, then I want you to know you can't be forgiven of that. Because Christ came into the world because we are sinners and we are in need of grace. Christ came to the world because we cannot speak pure words. And so we need to seek Him and ask Him to forgive us of our sins, of this sin and all of all our sins, of course. And you can even call out and say to Christ, Jesus, I have a problem with this. I have difficulty with this. I am unable to speak the right words, uh, speak truthfully. And Christ can help you. He is able because He not only came to die for our sins, He also came to live for us and keep God's moral law perfectly, which includes the ninth commandment. So rely upon Him. Trust in Him, beloved. Hold fast to Him. Now, if you are one who is outside of Christ, then you are in need of Christ to save you not only from your lying, 
But from all your sins, you need to go to Christ and cling to Him and hold fast to Him to deliver you from your sins. Listen what the Scriptures say concerning, in particular, uh, uh, various sins. It says, but for the cowardly and the unbelieving, this is Revelation 21.8, and the abominable and the murderers and the sexual and moral persons and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars. So in the midst of all those various sins, lying is included. Their part will be in the lake that will burn with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The penalty of sin is death. But thanks be to God, through Christ Jesus our Lord, we can be delivered from the wrath to come if we trust and hold fast to Christ. So if you don't know Christ, come to Him, run to Him, hold fast to Him, confess your sin to Him. And if you come, He will not cast you out. Christian, you can trust God's precious promises because they are true, because they are sincere, and because they are honest. So when he says that he has the promise of life to those who believe, you can trust that promise of eternal life. When he promises that he will abide with you forever, you can trust that promise because it is true and he is being sincere and honest. You can trust the promise that he who began a good work in you will continue it on to the end. You can trust his promise of completing his purifying work. Beloved, you can trust the promises of the new covenant, the forgiveness of sins, sanctification, and knowing God. God has made these promises, and they are true, they are sincere, and they are honest. So when you have doubts, when you have struggles as a believer, and you say, oh no, I've committed this sin, know that you can be forgiven. Trust that promise. Well, let me conclude with these words. We see then from this psalm the tension of the walking of faith. Reliance on God's precious promises and the sober reality of the ever-present vileness of man. How often do we let the latter overwhelm us? We see what is going on around us and we may quiver in fear or throw up our hands and want to give up. Instead, we need to rely all that much more on God's covenant keeping, on, uh, on God's precious promises. Pray that the Holy Spirit would strengthen our dependence upon our steadfast covenant-keeping God. Remember, we're being held in the strong hands of our faithful Savior who has promised to never let us go. We can trust in this precious promise because the words of Yahweh are pure words as silver tried in a furnace on the ground refined seven times. Let us pray.